Jason Pack. And I'm Alex Hall Hall, and this is Disorder, the podcast where we don't avoid hard truths, we don't beat about the bush, and we're not afraid to call a spade a spade. This is about trying to find a semblance of order in our mad, 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 mad world. And this week, we're going to try to order the disorder in a different kind of way. We'll be hearing from a woman at the front lines of the fight, a woman who speaks with immense moral clarity and comes from a place of intimate knowledge of the personal stakes that it costs to fight against disorder and injustice. Sadly, the enduring disorder has made kidnappings and human rights violations par for the course in our global politics. But nowhere on earth does the state use punitive torture and the fear of covert assassination or arbitrary imprisonment as a deterrent against free speech or pro-democracy advocacy as sinisterly and as calculatedly as in Putin's Russia. Only Putin has brought punishment, torture, arbitrary arrests, chemical weapons, Novichok poisonings, and things that if someone made them up, you would say, no way, there's no way that any regime could actually do this. But this is what someone on planet Earth with a bazillion nuclear weapons is actually doing to his political opponents. He's brought this kind of inhuman torture to a new level. But what's really amazing is that even in countries as repressive as Russia, there are still people who are willing to take the huge personal risks for themselves and their families and speak up and fight back and say, this is not right. We don't agree to these abuses and we don't agree to what's being done in our name. We talked about the extraordinary courage of such people in our previous episode with the former US member of Congress, Tom Malinowski. And in that episode, we heard about the specific case of the Russian opposition politician, Vladimir Karamurza, who not only highlighted corruption in Putin's Russia, but also helped American and British lawmakers create a legal framework to hold Putin's thugs and oligarchs to account. This is the Magnitsky Act, which imposes personal sanctions on named individuals for specific human rights abuses. It was the very fact that he succeeded in imposing such real costs on Putin's cronies that has made him a, quote, personal enemy of the Kremlin. And just like another personal enemy of the Kremlin, Alexei Navalny, Vladimir Karamurza has had the belief that a genuinely patriotic, pro-democratic Russian politician needs to be inside Russia, calling out Putin's war crimes, kleptocracy, and hypocrisy directly to the Russian people. And just like Navalny, Vladimir wasn't going to let previous poisonings stop him. He therefore undertook the courageous step of returning to Russia, even after it had invaded Ukraine in 2022, to continue his work trying to shed light on the injustices of Russian actions. And tragically, almost with the kind of inevitability of a Greek tragedy, Vladimir Karamurza was sentenced to 25 years for high treason in a completely politically motivated and trumped up case, and then packaged off to a penal colony, which is essentially a kind of legalized torture, Alex. The mere, the mere thought of it makes my eyes water. So we at the Disorder Pod today are incredibly grateful, deeply moved, and very humbled to have the opportunity to interview Vladimir's wife, Evgenia Karamurza, who's a human rights activist in her own right, as well as a journalist, translator, and campaigner. Evgenia is the advocacy director of the Free Russia Foundation. She's a trained translator and interpreter and has deployed those skills as a campaigner and human rights activist, in which role she recently won the 2023 Magnitsky Award for Courage Under Fire. Wow, Alex. 
In this episode, we're going to be drawing on Evgenia's experience working on these human rights issues around the world to talk about why democracy seems to be on the back foot in so many places and what more we could do and should be doing to help our allies around the world order the world. I began our interview by trying to situate Evgenia, how she became who she is and what shaped her mental picture. So I asked her about her rather unique upbringing in Russia's Far East, where she grew up on an island in the Pacific. I was actually born on one of the four disputed islands, Ashikatan, because my father used to be an officer of the Coast Guard. That's where he was sent. And what I do remember from my childhood is that I never felt isolated from the mainland because I had one set of grandparents, my mother's parents, who lived in Murmansk in the north of Russia, and another set of grandparents in the south of Russia, in the Krasnodar region. I would travel across the entire Soviet Union to see them with my parents, and I felt like the world was such a big and amazing place. I was, I think, exposed to other cultures. Russia is a big country living in 11 time zones, and Soviet Union was even bigger. And through traveling, I could see those representatives of different ethnicities speaking their own languages. They all spoke Russian as well, because that was the Soviet Union, but they also spoke their native languages. And that never surprised or bothered me. That was the way I saw the world. And also, I realized that the world is really a small place, because the concerns that we have are also similar. The problems that we live through, the struggles that we live through, are also similar. One of the key themes of this podcast is that the problems that are happening in sub-Saharan Africa or in Ukraine or in Ohio are affecting all of us all at once. And that's a defining feature of our era of the enduring disorder. Even if you say that you are just concerned with your own small politics and your own country, you're actually having to deal with global concerns. So I'm an internationalist, but I'm also someone who really cares about America and Britain. I see you as an internationalist, but someone who also cares about Russia. Would you say that you're a Russian patriot? My husband is definitely a Russian patriot. He almost died twice for his country, to bring change to his country. And is now in jail in strict regime, sentenced to 25 years of strict regime for opposing Vladimir Putin and saying no to the war with Ukraine. I am definitely a cosmopolitan more than I am a patriot of any specific country, but what is happening to Russia today hurts me deeply. Vladimir Putin did not jump out of a small box he has been on the scene for over two decades, committing the same crimes again and again and again. The Russian people is, of course, responsible for the fact that Vladimir Putin has grown into a monster. But so are those uh, leaders in the West who kept accepting the money stolen from the Russian population, who kept allowing those crooks and murderers to hide that money in their banking systems because they were more interested in doing business with Vladimir Putin than in countering human rights violations that were happening inside of the country. And Vladimir Putin has already invaded Georgia, annexed Crimea, carried out bombings of Syria and uh, led uh, an awful war in Chechnya. Those leaders in the West who were willing to close their eyes to what was happening and instead preferred resetting their relations with Vladimir Putin, giving him yet another chance, finding a compromise with him. They contributed a lot to the fact that Vladimir Putin has grown into a monster, that his regime has grown into a monster. And now the whole world has to deal with the consequences because there is a full-scale war in the middle of Europe. So if we look ahead, whether you're a cosmopolitan or a Russian patriot, what might a post-Putin Russia look like? 
Well, the problem of today's uh, Russia is not its territory. It's not the fact that it's so vast that it lives in 11 time zones. It's the political system that has been installed in the country. But are not those things connected? Because the very nature of the centralization of power and the rise of the intelligent state was already happening in the czarist period. Do you know what I mean? This is something that we had in the 19th century as a way for a vast empire to govern these almost ungovernable distances? Well, you know, the UK used to be an empire, such an empire that had such vast territories that were basically ungovernable. So it stopped being an empire and became a normal country. And so did Germany. And (laughs) so did France. So it's not impossible, absolutely. And I do believe that the problem is in the system. Inside of Russia, in those uh, ethnic regions, there is not much demand, according to the polls and to the activists who work in these regions, not much demand for Russia to collapse and into a lot of uh, small countries. There is the demand for federalization. There is the demand for decentralization of powers. There is a demand for Russia to become a normal parliamentary republic where one person would not be able to consolidate power in his or her hands, where parliament would actually become a place for discussion, where parliamentarians would actually be representing the people who would be electing them to represent them. So I do believe that it is the problem of today's Russia is this centralization of powers, and that's the dictatorial regime of Vladimir Putin. You know, his uh, Westminster speech, Ronald Reagan, American President Ronald Reagan, said that it would be cultural condescendence or worse to think that any people would prefer dictatorship over democracy. So saying that Russia is somehow unable, unfit for democracy, I believe, in the words of President Ronald Reagan, would be cultural condescendence or worse. I do believe that we are capable. My husband is a historian, and he says that whenever the Russian people had actually access to free and fair elections, it always chose the pro-democracy path. But in today's Russia, according to international organizations, we have not seen one free and fair election since year 2000. That's over 20 years of stolen elections where people did not really have the right to voice their opinion. I want to ask you about the trend from the late Soviet period to now. An interesting thing that was happening certainly gaining steam in the 80s under Gorbachev is the rise of dissidents, people who wanted to speak their mind and who were engaged. Could you sketch out for people who don't follow Russia so closely the connection between anti-Soviet dissidents, whether they were politicians or writers or cultural figures, to today's dissidents What are those cultural connections over the last 30 or 40 years? I think the main connection is the same that connects all freedom fighters in the world. Those are people who do not accept what is happening in their country and what is being done allegedly in their names. And they want to say no to the regime, to the war, to whatever. So in the Soviet times... I know that my husband has always been very deeply influenced by those Soviet dissidents. Not only is he a Russian politician, but he's also a journalist, a filmmaker, um, a writer. And uh, his first documentary that is uh, freely available on YouTube is called They Chose Freedom. That was a documentary about the fight of the Soviet dissidents. And the documentary is absolutely astonishing because uh, it has... All of them, you know. There's, we'll uh, make that available in the show notes of the episode because it's a great documentary. I've seen it. It is. Yes, I, I do love it. And I recently rewatched it because what is happening today reminds me of their struggle, of course. In that documentary, my husband put together Natan Shiransky and Yelena Bonner, uh, Natalia Garbanevska and Pavel Litvinov and Victor Feinberg and and Dream Luga and, uh, and uh, so many voices 
the voices of those people who not only fought the Soviet regime, but who basically saved the honor of the people. And today, those uh, people who say no to the war, who say no to the Putin regime, and they put themselves in grave risk for doing that, they not only risk their freedom, but very often their lives because uh, the regime is using all the repressive methods used in the Soviet Union, including punitive psychiatry and basically life sentences for these people. Torture doesn't even surprise anyone anymore in the Russian penitentiary system. So these people, they're doing the same thing. Not only do they fight the regime and show to the world that there are a lot of Russians who oppose what is happening, but they also are the honor of our country. Those people, there are no mass protests in today's Russia. Those protests are mostly solitary or small group protesting. Everything is being done to destroy any kind of horizontal connections that exist in society so that there is no right of assembly, no right of association. People are not allowed to even have the thoughts of coming together. There's uh, recently been this... um, presidential candidate that everyone has been talking about, Yekaterina Duntsova. A uh, young mother of uh, three living in the Tverskaya region. She's a journalist and she put forward her candidature for the upcoming presidential so-called election. (laughs) I will use the quotation marks because this uh, procedure cannot really be called an election. So she did that. She declared that she would be creating a party. Right away, she was detained. Yeah. There's another anti-war candidate, Boris Nadezhdin, and there have already been signs of pressure against him. So anyone who dares oppose the official narrative will come under pressure from the regime. And this is a regime which has learned all the lessons from more than 100 plus years of dictatorship in Russia, but dictatorships around the world. And I was thinking there about how all ideological dictatorships understand the need to prevent free association of people. If you look at North Korea or Qaddafi's Libya or the Ba'ath Party in Iraq or Syria, they instantly understand we can't have people who are all meeting together because of their interest in this social activity or this intellectual idea, because that's a threat. So in Qaddafi's Green Book, he says, not only no political parties, but no alternative social groups and no ethnic meetings. The Berbers can't meet as Berbers. They can't use their language or meet for social or cultural purposes, because that's a threat. And Obviously, Putin, as evil and twisted a man as he is, he's an intelligent person. And he's understood that as soon as someone wants to get together with other like-minded individuals in a social club or a book club, that's a threat for ideas to spread. So they shut that down immediately. Absolutely. Hence, also repression against any cultural influencers writers, actors, bloggers, and of course, repression against journalists who spread ideas, who diffuse information. And hence, anyone who opposes the official narrative, just like in the Soviet times, is represented, portrayed today as either a criminal, a spy, a traitor, or an insane person. And if we talk about what Vladimir Putin got from the Soviet times and how this is the continuity of the same regime, really, in essence, we should remember that as prime minister in 1999, he put a memorial plaque to Andropov on the FSB building in downtown Moscow. Andropov was someone who introduced punitive psychiatry in the Soviet Union, one of the most odious figures in that system. And it is to this person that Vladimir Putin decided to install a memorial plaque. So even back in 1999, it was already clear whom 
Vladimir Putin saw as his examples to follow. So, yes, dictators work like that. They learn from each other. They work with each other. They adopt each other's practices. It's always squashing of any kind of dissidents, always portraying those who oppose them as criminals or traitors. Those instruments are always the same, sadly. That's a very good point. And it also takes me back to your question about patriotism and cosmopolitanism. It's all about us being pieces of the same puzzle. And I think that Vladimir's refusal to leave the country is led also by the same idea. You are the one to decide what kind of human being you want to be. The choice to be an honest, honorable, decent person is always yours to make. And that ultimately identifies what kind of partner, parent, citizen of your country, citizen of the world you will become. That choice of yours, and in the words of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., our lives begin to end the moment we become silent about things that matter. So seeing the world as a big puzzle and yourself as a piece of that puzzle is important. And that we can't confront the disorder globally and those who wish to repress without cadres of committed activists. What amazes me about your husband's story and that of Alexei Navalny and others is their courage to put their own lives on the line. Rather than just saying, oh, this is how it should be, no, I'm going to put my life on the line and risk the imprisonment, the torture, the suffering. I think that we have become complacent in the West. Trump is a huge threat to our democracy, the way I see it, but he's also a threat to global order, freedom of expression, artistic creativity. He's a threat to much more than just how America is governed. But we need people who are willing to literally take the kind of risks and have the courage that your husband or Alexei Navalny has. I see dictatorship and the threats to democracy winning because of apathy. You and I are not apathetic because our lives are waged in this political domain. But for the people who matter among some of these less represented communities, I encounter a lot of apathy. I think maybe the problem here is that very often in developed democratic societies, those rights and freedoms are taken for granted. People are born with these rights and freedoms. They're used to them. They take them as something that has always been there and will always be there. And they do not realize that democracy is something that you work at every single day and that it needs defending because there will always be people like President Trump who will be slightly envious (laughs) of people like Vladimir Putin. If only he could have that power. There will always be people like that because that is human nature. And democracy has to be defended every single day and defended in a proactive way, not just controlling the damage, not just trying to minimize the consequences, but in a proactive way through informing society and teaching society, educating society about the dangers of such regimes. To me, honestly, it is astonishing that the world sees what the regime of Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine. And yet, democracy in many countries is slipping as if They looked at it and did not realize how close that danger is to them if they only allow democracies to sleep further, if they only give up their rights and freedoms, some of them. And it's astonishing and scary. But it is sadly all too predictable because if we go back to 2008 and the Georgia invasion, the lack of enforcement of the red line, in Syria in 2012, 2013, and then the 2014 annexation of Crimea and invasion of Donbass. Those of us who are in this game pointed out, 
hey, if the EU can't act with one voice, hey, if we can't get our act together now, this is just going to go on until it's too late. But a principle of what I term the enduring disorder is that the disordering actors, and Putin is a major one, but Xi in China and Erdogan and Bolsonaro and Orban, they understand that they win when the West is disunited. And by keeping it disunited, it can't act coherently. Part of the reason that it can't act coherently is the case is not made to the electorates in the US and the UK that those issues happening over there are really a threat to your freedoms and way of life over here. So what I want to ask you is, we understand why Russians don't want to live under an extractive mafia state that doesn't allow freedom of association and jails dissidents and is horrible. But how would you make the case to British and American voters who say, yes, I don't want to live under an extractive mafia state, but I'm not so concerned about things that are happening over there. That's over there. How do we make that case better? Oh, but everything is influenced by military conflicts. I mean, economies suffer, not just in the countries that are directly influenced, like Russia and Ukraine. But the problem is that allowing Vladimir Putin to get away with committing the same crimes for over two decades, the world has allowed him to believe himself invincible, untouchable. And now that he's leading a huge war of aggression in the middle of Europe, the entire European Union, the United States, the entire civilized world has to support Ukraine because Ukraine is fighting for the same values on which these countries are built. If Vladimir Putin is allowed to get away with committing those crimes in Ukraine, he will go further. So soon enough, these people in the European Union, in the US and everywhere else will not just have to send money or military equipment to Ukraine, but they will have to send their kids to fight this dictatorship that will continue spreading around until it is stopped. And it all begins with human rights violations inside of the country. Well, Vladimir Putin has been using political assassination as a tool for many years. The leader of the Russian opposition, Boris Nemtsov, was gunned down 100 yards away from the Kremlin walls. People went to prison for peacefully protesting in the streets of Russian cities. People were being persecuted and killed. And the entire world community expressed concern and then went on doing business with Vladimir Putin. He didn't become the Russian president and launched a huge war right away. No, he did it step by step. What if I do this? Will the world respond? If the world does not respond, maybe I can do something else. If we zoom out to what the legal, institutional and other mechanisms that Western states have to combat human rights violations in other parts of the world. The Magnitsky Act has been one of the great successes of the last decade or more. Why is it that it was so difficult to adopt and it required heroic efforts by Bill Browder, by your husband, by others? Who was pushing against it? No one wanted to make Vladimir Putin angry. Appeasement. It's just that simple. It's much easier today in the rhetoric when people say Russia did this and Russia did that. My husband is also Russia. Alexander Skochilenko, an artist and a pacifist who went to prison for seven years for switching price tags at a local supermarket with anti-war messages, is also Russia. Boris Nemtsov, who was assassinated on the Bolshevik-Moskvarysky Bridge in Moscow in 2015, is also Russia. These people, the thousands and thousands of Russian citizens who went out to protest against the war, to protest against Vladimir Putin's policies, are also Russia. So the Magnitsky Act names specific human rights violators. It puts them on the spot and it says, we know that you did this and that, and we're going to go after you and we're going to hold you responsible. 
That's the revolutionary nature of that law. But by naming names, by putting someone on the spot, you, of course, risk provoking the wrath of those regimes who allow their officials, their businessmen, whoever they are, the operatives of the regime, to commit those crimes. But let's talk about this kind of cowardice. And I agree, there's a lot of Western cowardice on behalf not only of legislators but officials. Let's say that I'm a congressman from Iowa, a Republican congressman from Iowa. Why am I scared to name not only Vladimir Putin but the Attorney General of Novosibirsk Oblast. Why is he scared? You know, he doesn't go to Russia. His electorate doesn't mind. What's the difficulty for them? As far as I remember, most pushback was not from parliaments, but from governments. I don't know. Why, Vla- why uh, did George Bush see Vladimir Putin's soul in his eyes? Why did Barack Obama decide to reset relations with a murderer, a thief and a murderer? Why would they go time and again and offer compromises to a bully? To me, this is incomprehensible. I don't get that. Let's talk about ordering the disorder. Given what you've learned in your life and the tragedies that you've experienced, which are many, and I have so much sympathy and respect for what you've been through and your family. How would you take away lessons from the Western mishandling of Putin, distill them for how we can deter China and deal with China when it cracks down on pro-democracy activists, when they round up people in Hong Kong and they put them on show trials? What can we learn from all the mistakes that were done in Russia before it's too late when we're dealing with these pro-democracy activists in mainland China and Hong Kong? I think that when you give a person the benefit of the doubt, it's all very good. It's all very civilized and polite to give a person the benefit of a doubt. But shouldn't these leaders, Western leaders, uh, judge a person by what he or she does? rather than what he or she says. Vladimir Putin says all the right things. He's talked about democracy and the rule of law and uh, independent judicial and the role of parliament for so many times over these 20 years. But meanwhile, he threw people in jail, committed invasions of our neighbors and used uh, political assassination as a tool to get rid of his opponents. So when the reset was launched. That was already after so many political assassinations took place in Russia and not just in Russia and outside of Russia as well. It was uh, after the invasion of Georgia. It was after violent squashes of peaceful protests in Russia, numerous peaceful protests in Russia. Maybe they should judge by what a person does, not what a person says. And my other point is that for as long as realpolitik will win over the defense of democratic values, democracy will continue sleeping. I remember the 2012 peaceful protests in Moscow when people were beaten into pulp in the streets of the capital and then thrown in jail with lengthy prison sentences. It was the Bolotnaya protests. The entire democratic community expressed very deep concern about that. And then the deal for the construction of Nord Stream was signed. The message was very clear. The message to Vladimir Putin that he could get away with doing this easily because those are internal matters and they do not uh, concern the rest of the world. And the other message was sent to the Russian people. Sorry, you're on your own. We have our own interests and we will follow these interests. If realpolitik continues winning over democratic values, democracy will continue sleeping. The whole approach needs to change. Realpolitik cannot continue winning. Those are great points, Evgenia. And I want to come back to something that I proposed based on your comments at the Henry Jackson Society in London when we first met. And this is the issue of automaticity. 
And I think that this is relevant for what we can learn from Russia vis-a-vis -vis China. What do I mean by automaticity? I made up this word. It's really great to have a thing called the Budapest Memorandum and the British and the Russians sign it. But if it doesn't say automatically what the action that the U.S. Congress and the commander-in-chief will take on it being violated is, when the moment of the thing being violated, it's then very difficult to get the political will at that moment because someone else in the future has a different set of interests than the person who signed the thing 20 years before. You can solve all these problems by passing laws and signing treaties with automatic responses. So I'm going to propose an idea and you tell me what you think when it comes to China. We could have issues baked into U.S. law that govern how the Chinese deal with Hong Kong. And it could have been when Hong Kong was handed back from the British that the British could have said in that handback, if, for example, an independent commission determines that you did not allow the free and fair elections in Hong Kong that you said as part of our giving you Hong Kong back, we are taking this sanction and we're having this action and this and this and this. And it's not a question of deciding. It's baked into the British laws and automatic action. What are your thoughts? Well, I think that developments have shown that democracies are not very well equipped to deal with the kind of aggression and the kind of pressure that uh, autocrats of the world demonstrate. And I think that democracies definitely need to be more proactive in their approach. When a human rights violation is committed, when something like an invasion or the violence quashing of peaceful protests, the annexation of territory happens, people in like me should not be campaigning for years to get a specific reaction, not the expression of concern, but a specific to introduce a specific consequence. We should not be campaigning for that for years. It should be written somewhere or it should be used as a preventive measure. Say, if uh, such a leader chooses to do something like that, such as such sanction will befall him or her. Correct. That's automaticity. Yeah. That it, it has to be baked into our laws. And I also think that there's an important principle of being on the front foot. Let's say, given your moral credibility and what you've been through, you were appointed queen for a day of the global system, global orderer in chief. What is the one institutional body that you would create? Not a law but a global institution. How would you create that institution? What would it do? This is going to be very personal. Over the past two years, I've been campaigning on behalf of political prisoners in the Russian Federation, one of whom is my husband, and fighting for the release. And I realized that Many democracies are very badly equipped to deal with a growing crisis of hostage-taking and political imprisonment. And most countries' response is that we do not deal with those people, we do not engage, because we don't want to give autocrats more incentives to take more hostages or prisoners. And I believe that in the civilized world, in the 21st century, such approach is absolutely unacceptable. Because whether democracies engage or not, autocrats continue taking hostages and continue imprisoning people for political reasons. So it is very close to my heart. I believe that following the example of the United States that has such an office, of Office for Hostage Affairs, where Ambassador Carstens, Roger Carstens, fights for the release of political prisoners, of hostages, other democracies should also follow the example of the United States. And my main idea is not to create offices everywhere that would exchange prisoners. That's not the main idea, although freeing those who are behind bars in today's world for standing up for the rule of law and democracy and for defending those values on which democratic countries are built is important. 
and fighting for these people is truly a moral cause because these people represent the world as we want to see it, living in peace with each other and respecting each other's rights and freedoms. But I believe that my main argument for the establishment of such offices is that exactly what I was saying, that democracies need to be proactive. Those autocrats work together. They learn from each other and adopt each other's practices. Democracies should also bring their efforts together to create a set of instruments that would curb this crisis, that would prevent autocrats to take more hostages and imprison people for political reasons. And yes, they can use such preventive mechanisms as personal sanctions. If you want to engage in such practices, this is what will happen to you. And other proactive measures can be used as well. That would be the responsible approach of democracies toward the growing crisis of hostage taking. And that would show to those autocrats that those people who are being imprisoned because of their views, because of their opinions, will not be left alone that it is concerning for the entire democratic world that these people are suffering such fate and that the free world will be fighting for them. And I believe this is the message of solidarity that is lacking today and it is very much needed. After the break, We'll draw on Evgenia's incredibly powerful story for lessons on how to order the disorder. So Jason, I think that was one of the most powerful interviews we have done. Evgenia was so angry and felt and conveyed to us the outrage at the injustice that's being done, not just to her husband, of course, but to the Russian people. And what came through for me loud and clear as well is her sheer frustration at our inability to draw a proper line. Words are easy. We condemn, we deplore, we express concern, but it's actually taking the action to impose real consequences for Putin's actions that will make the difference. And we need to understand that he is motivated by what's going on in his own society domestically, how he protects himself. How do we change that calculation for him so that the costs of continuing with his malign activities become personally painful for him? How do we create that disincentive? Well, that's exactly what the Magnitsky Act and other forms of individualized sanctions against foreign dictatorial leaders who violate human rights is attempting. But back to Evgenia, yes, I mean, I was actually moved to tears. And I think, crucially, given all that's going on in the world today, Alex, it's really challenging to sometimes think why does what we've done with our careers actually make a difference? How is it actually making the world a better place? Am I just talking and writing articles and having meetings and giving papers? It's important to step back and realize, wait a second, we have to stand up for what we believe in. I have written about appeasement for more than a decade now. I guess I'm getting old. And when I wrote my first paper, Faustian Bargains, Appeasement, in the Libyan context, I thought that the Libyan government had just appeased the militias. The militias were bothersome. So they're like, here's some money. We want to pay you a salary. Please don't rebel. And we need to call a spade a spade. The West has appeased Putin. It has. We've let her and the Russian people down, and we risk letting the Ukrainians down right now. And it's really, really heartbreaking to me when Evgenia mentions the word apathy, because obviously we're in this profession, so we're not apathetic. And it may be difficult for us to grasp Joe Blow in Iowa and Joseph so-and-so in Newcastle that might have apathy towards these issues. I think that if they understood the issues, they wouldn't be apathetic. And so it really is incumbent on us, which is why 
there's the public communication aspect of these things, to have it be more broadly understood in Iowa and Newcastle, why what's happening over there affects you here. Yes. One of the challenges is how do we make people understand that human rights and security aren't two different choices? They are two sides of the same coin. And I used to find it so frustrating during the so-called height of the war on terrorism, how many times I would have arguments within the British Foreign Office with people who were working on counterterrorism. In fact, I had a stand-up argument with our then ambassador to Moscow about this at a heads of mission conference where he accused me of being wishy-washy and naive and stupidly idealistic and thinking we should have any concerns about human rights in Russia when we needed Russia as a security partner on terrorism. Now, I would say history has proved me right and him wrong, but I used to have that argument over and over and over again with embassies across the world that we can't afford to let human rights ideals get in the way of our hard-nosed security interests. And that is such the wrong way to think about it. What happens in those countries is a security issue because the countries that are most repressive, least accountable to their people, have no free and fair elections, are the countries that are pursuing nuclear weapons, that are invading their neighbors, are precipitating refugee outflows, who are processing and laundering their kleptocratic proceeds in our systems and are using their bots and trolls to try and undermine our own democracy. Human rights and democracy are not just abstract concepts and a luxury, a luxury belief. They are fundamental to our own security. It's really nice to have moral clarity here, Alex, and you're just resonating with what Evgenia has said by not standing up for these rights elsewhere and in the global environment, we've all created the monster of Putin. And Evgenia made that clear. So I think this is a nice point, Alex, to pivot to what we can do about it. And Evgenia put forth a compelling argument that naming and shaming works. Things like the Magnitsky Act um, are actually quite effective. I'd like to elucidate your views on this topic that I brought up with Evgenia, Alex, automaticity. And and what I mean by that, just to be totally clear to the listeners, is it's really difficult when you have a law or a treaty written by one government or regime, and then there are elections and someone of the opposing political party comes into power and they're not so concerned with the issue. And they're like, ah, there's this treaty, but I mean, I don't really want to risk my credibility or threaten the election or, you know, I just can't be bothered with this. So I propose the idea of automaticity, which is whereby democratic governments tie their hands behind their backs and legally compel themselves that when certain things are determined to have happened, that in the future, it automatically inside the bureaucracy initiates various actions. And I can see lots of potential counter challenges to this, but having worked in the field for almost 25 years now, I feel that some responses in democracies need to have a degree of automaticity. Otherwise, the wheels of government will always be threatened by different partisan viewpoints. How do you feel, Alex? Okay. I like the idea very much. And it actually already exists in certain ways in that, for example, weapons sales to third countries are conditional upon adherence to certain human rights. And if there is a clear breach of those human rights, normally the weapons supplies would be curtailed. The Americans, I believe, have very strong legislation that cuts off aid to a country where there's been a military coup and the ousting of a democratically elected government. The problem you have is that it turns out, A, to be quite a blunt instrument. An example I'll give you is in Thailand, where they've had a series of military coups, including one more recently, and the military junta is still in power there. And by cutting off all aid to that country, it has just encouraged that country to draw closer to China and look for other options. Brian Class talked about this in episode one of the podcast. Yes, he did. He did. 
So one is it can be quite a blunt instrument that can have uh, payback in an unexpected way. And so secondly, what you usually do is in those legislation, you would put in waivers or opt-outs for national security reasons. And that's how we justify half our arms sales around the world. Well, it's in the national security interest or there are special circumstances. Another unintended consequence is if the government really wants to continue with an existing policy and doesn't want to break off cooperation or doesn't want to apply the sanctions, another sort of consequence is it could be, well, we don't think that human rights situation is as bad. Our current government wishes to send migrants who cross the channel trying to get into the UK to the country of Rwanda. Our human rights report criticizes human rights in Rwanda. So what do you think they're going to do? Are they going to pull the Rwanda policy or are they going to amend and water down the criticisms of Rwanda in our annual human rights report? And they've actually, this government's gone even further. The courts in the UK have deemed that they don't have enough evidence to believe that Rwanda is a safe place to send migrants to. The British government is actually passing legislation where it just states Rwanda is a safe country. So these automatic instruments, they can be too blunt, they can have unintended consequences, and then they will have waivers and opt-outs to allow governments to get around them. And those waivers and opt-outs sometimes make sense, as in the Thailand case, but they don't always work in the ideal way that we would like them to. That was a really good explanation, Alex, of the world as it is and how automaticity is used in things like arms sales with the various ITARs that Congress has to pass and and the British equivalents that you mentioned. I was referring to a different kind of automaticity, though, which is the automaticity of individual sanctions against regime officials who engage in human rights violations. So slightly different than categorizing whole countries. Is a country safe? Is it this, that? I'll leave that for people with more experience in the diplomatic world. But I love the idea of having a law on the books that, for example, in concert with the EU, UK, and US, shows when a given Libyan militia leader, we determine that he runs a essentially forced labor camp of African migrants or has murdered his opponents, we don't let him have bank accounts in our countries and we have some sanctions against him. This is like not asking a huge amount. I want to be clear what I mean for automaticity here, because there are many people in the Russian state apparatus who are involved in what allows penal torture in Russia to be quote unquote legal, who are connected to people who are billionaires and own property in Miami and London and stuff. So like, I'm not asking to really push the boat out here. I only want automaticity in this really, really obvious way that I think we could rally Republicans and Democrats, Tory and Labour and our EU allies on without getting into too much politics. Okay. So we began this episode talking about the need for moral clarity. And now I'm busy making every single good idea murky. (laughs) (laughs) So yes, I think it's easier to apply automaticity in the individual and the personal, but you still run into difficulties. How high up the level of responsibility do you go? You get the prison guard who pulls fingernails out you get the battalion commander who tortures Ukrainian prisoners in captivity. You get the deputy to Putin who arranges a political assassination. You get Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, who is believed to be directly responsible for the murder of the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi in the consulate in Istanbul. So do those automatic sanctions apply to MBS? And then immediately we get into our political dilemma again, which is we want to work with Saudi Arabia. And in fact, MBS has not been sanctioned. And what we got was Biden fist bumping with him, which is the new way to not shake hands with dictators. Oh, Alex, too smart for your own good, as always. (laughs) Um, This is a big thought podcast, Alex, and I am far from being naive that there are magic bullets out there. 
I don't think that there's a magic bullet sanctions law that we can pass that will instantly, at the snap of a finger, make it more difficult for the Thai junta or people around Putin to torture their enemies. Do you know what I mean? I think that hearing the moral clarity and the courage under fire, which Evgenia puts forward, we need to stand up and say, people like her and her husband are our allies, but more than being our allies as the West or the US or the UK, these are people who are global leaders and upstanding global citizens of an ordered world. And that from any viewpoint, be it Russian or Japanese or Fijian, we want that we live in a world where people who have that kind of courage and clarity can speak their truth. So I think that's a good note to end on for this week. If you too want to help order the disorder, you can tap follow right now and you'll be notified when every new episode launches. And we're also going to be recording episodes with listener questions soon. So if you have a burning question you'd like us to answer, please email us at disordershow at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media. Just search Disorder Show. And for more about Evgenia and her husband's extraordinary story, visit our show notes and subscribe to our Substack via the show notes link where we're going to be sharing more information about Evgenia and her husband, such as the documentary that Vladimir worked on or some of his articles and advocacy or more biographies about the couple. Our producer is George McDonough. Our executive producer is Neil Fern. Thank you for listening. Hope that uh, this interview moved you as much as it did Alex and I. And here's wishing you an orderly week. Mm-hmm.